Yes, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 31, and I don't want to dilly-dally, so we're going to start reading in verse 6. We're going to read about a group of people. It's very interesting. Do a Bible study sometime on the men of Jabesh Gilead. And they're only mentioned a few times in Scripture, but the times they are mentioned, it's always something really strange, something that's really different. Amen? Something that stands out. And we're going to talk about them today. But anyway, let's begin reading in uh, verse 6. So Saul died. And his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Geboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. Now let me, let me stop right there for a second. This same story is told in 1st Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1st Chronicles 10 and verse 10. We see the same thing, but we get a little clarification. We find that it, that they went to the house of Ashtaroth and that they hung their bodies on the wall of Bashan, but they had fastened Saul's head in the temple of Dagon. Now, let me put some things together for you here today. The church's enemy has always been the religious elite. Right. Always. It was the same true here. It's the same with Catholicism and Protestantism today. It's the same enemy. Same problem. Amen. And it's unfortunate that we have the gospel and we declare it. And people will, the first thing they'll ask is not, how can I have this great repentance? How can I have this Christ? They say, well, how big is your church? I need to know before I come. Uh, what kind of uh, programs do you have for your outreach? How many buses are you running? How big is your altar call? Right? Amen. You know where they get all that from? They get it all from our enemies. Yep. Amen. And the only reason they're not killing us now is because the government won't let them. But boy, there's going to come a time when the Antichrist arise, you can bet they're going to be searching us out. Yep. Amen? Right. Anyway, these enemies, let me tell you a little bit about them. In, in his armor, they hung in the house of Ashtaroth. Now, let me tell you, Ashtaroth is plural for Ashtoreth. In other words, this was like the county seat. Okay? And Ashtaroth was the town there, and this area they all worshipped. Ashtara. Get it so far? That's not too deep, is it? Ashtara. Ashtara is who you see when you drive by Starbucks coffee. And you see this little mermaid. By the way, if you saw the whole picture of the mermaid, you'd go, my soul, that's lewd. Amen? But they just give you a little picture of it. Uh, this half fish, half woman. By the way, that's their take on Mother Earth. That's their take on the goddess of heaven. And today we know her in the Catholic realm as Mary. Yeah. Come on now, don't, don't be afraid. You know, jump up, it's the truth. Right. Mary is Ashtoreth here. I'm going to tell you what, they, they were the enemies of God. Now Saul, you can say what you want, he fell because of his own problems, his own compromise, but he was definitely the chosen of God to lead Israel. And when he was cut down, what do they do? They put him right there, the leader of God's people, and they put him right there in the house of their goddess. By the way, specifically down deep in was the temple of Dagon. Dagon is very interesting. He's the fish god. He's a merman. You have mermaid, merman. That's your titan. Amen. There's your Zeus. Yep. All right? All these false religions. And in old Babylon, that was... Uh, um, come on, don't be a... Nimrod. Hey man, it's Nimrod. All over religion, right? The Catholics call him God the Father. 
Amen? Yeah. But this, but he's not God the Father biblically. Right. They exalt Mary to a place that's equal with God the Father. That's old world religion. That's not new. Amen? That's always been the same. And it came from Babylon. And anyway, this, this Dagon thing was this fish, half fish, half man. Now, when you look at a bishop or a cardinal in the Catholic Church, they have the stupidest looking hat on you've ever seen. Yeah. And it looks like a pistachio that's about to split. And I think that's what it is, because there's a nut in there somewhere, amen? But they got this hat on, it's real tall, that is a fish mouth. That's exactly what that is, that's a fish mouth. Amen? Do you see what's going on here? The leader of God's people is seemingly, it seems like persecution has hit. God's people run one way and then uh, all the leaders of God get strewn up in the house of God and get made fun of and barked at and jeered at and so on. Am I right? Amen. You see the picture. And they put him right there, put their bodies right on the wall of Bethshen, which is a major city as well in that area. And everybody knew where the wall of Bethshen was. Anyway, with all this going on, look at verse 11. When the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night, by the way, it's about 20 miles, and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshen and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. They took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now what they did there was they had to rescue the bones. Those are Israelites on that wall. This is God's people on that wall. Had they not burnt them, they would have brought disease into their land. This has nothing to do with a ritual that says, hey, you can cremate somebody. Amen? It has nothing to do with that. They had to burn them because they were hanging out. They were already dead for some time. Blood everywhere on the battlefield. Their head, well, one of them, Saul's head chopped off. They're hung up on the body, on the wall. They're stinking. They're diseased. They had to burn their bodies to save their bones. But guess what they did with their bones? They buried them. Amen. And they had to do it quickly. They could not just bury them in that land. They, they were not going to bury God's people in the Philistines land. Amen. I don't want to die anywhere near the Catholic and Protestant land. I want to be in the house of God, serving God when I die. Amen. Amen. Even if I mess up, even if for some reason the ministry has to be stripped from me, I still want to die on God's side where God's people are and not in the world. Amen. Amen. Or with the Catholic religion. So, today, religion is very... Cotton candy. It's uh, like cotton candy. It's sweet. It's sticky. It's cheap. Amen. Ooey and gooey. But we see here some men who had the right religion. And these men risked their very lives to do right by their Lord. Amen. Saul was their king. Amen. And I want to know why these men risked their lives like that. I want to know what was different about Jabesh Gilead that they stood up and said, we're going to go get his bones off that wall no matter what it cost us. We're going to get his head out of the temple of Dagon. You know God was with them because how else would they have got in there? But they got in there and they got those bodies off that wall and they did the right thing. The littlest, most insignificant crowd in all Israel went and did that by the power of God. That's us, church. Amen. That's us. We are insignificant. We, we are nothing compared to, uh, religion or Christendom. We are, we are a joke. We are despised. But through the power of God, we'll see the converting power of the gospel in the hearts of men. Amen. Amen. That's right. David said, is there not a cause? Amen. Right. And everybody fled, but one little boy stood up and defeated the army of the Philistines. It's the same here. Anyway. Let me give you a little bit about Jabesh Gilead. Okay, now I'm going to give you more as we go because it's going to apply. But let me give you a little background here. When you read in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, you'll find a man by the name of Nahash 
the Ammonite. Nahash the Ammonite came on to Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead was on the east side of the Jordan River. Amen. Out there with the half tribe of Manasseh. And it was a little bitty town and they were a very peace loving town. You can tell. Amen. As a matter of fact, it was a priestly town. There was a lot of Levites that lived there. Um, I'll, I won't disclose some of this, but you'll see a little bit about their, their nature here a little bit more, uh, in a minute. But here they are in peace, and here comes Nahash the Ammonite, like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, comes up on this little weak town that cannot defend itself. They didn't show up against Saul. And this was early in Saul's, uh, being king, and they didn't show up against him. They went against this little thing. They're nipping at Israel just a little bit at a time, you see? And they come up there to Jabesh Gilead, and they said, come on out and surrender to us. Well, Jabesh Gilead knew they couldn't fight the Ammonites. And they said right away, hey, listen, let, let us pay tribute to you. We'll pay taxes, and we'll live under your law. How's that sound? And, and the king said, uh, um, or Nahash said, well, uh, if you're going to do that, I want your eyeballs. Oh, you, in other words, I ain't making a deal with you. You're going to come out and complete surrender and give me all your people and you're going to give me all your city. By the way, that's what sin does to you. Amen. I don't care how good your church is. I don't care how strong your testimony is. You start letting sin into your life. It'll start nipping you a little bit at a time. And it is not happy till it makes you blind and deaf and dead. Right. Amen. Anyway, so they called on Saul. They sent messengers and they called Saul. Saul, that was his first thing as king. I'm the king now. He's uh, head and shoulders above everyone else. And he says, we're going to go rescue them. And they went and they rescued them. They defeated Nahash the Ammonite. Amen. So church, anytime we think we got it bad, let's call our king. Amen. And let him do the rescuing. But you see this village, there's not much about him. But their king, the first thing he did in all of his realm, he he considered this little bitty group of people over here. And I'm going to tell you more about them later, and you're going to say, who would consider them? But he considered them, and he went out of the way, and he went and helped them and rescued them. And so I look at this, and I say, now we see these men, there's valiant men here, and they're rising up, and they're going to rescue the body of their Lord. Why? Why didn't they flee like everybody else? Well, I think I know why. And I want that to be our message this morning. I'm going to look at basically three things here of why they risked everything for their Lord. And I want to ask you, do you have the same motives? Are you willing to risk everything for your Lord? Amen. Amen. Because that's what Christ demands. That's That's what He demands. When that woman, uh, Mary, when she broke that alabaster box, uh, you want to talk about expensive. That's her whole life savings. Broken, poured out, used up for the Lord. That was a picture of her heart and her life. Amen. That's what God wants from us. And you know what? When you're saved and you can now with the Spirit of God understand Scripture and love your Lord and hate sin and all those things that are besetting or behind you and only glory is in front of you, you ain't got a problem in the world with that. Amen? So why did these people risk everything for their Lord? Number one, because of what they owed. They owed Him. They owed Him their very lives, their very existence. You see, I owe Him. How could I let His body just hang there in disgrace with His head in the temple of Dagon? How could I let my Lord's name be dragged through the mud and be consumed by the houses of idols? How can I allow that to go on? I can't because I owe Him too much. I owe Jesus too much to let His name be dissolved in Christendom. Amen. 
or to be your average Baptist, milk, toast, sweet, sticky, gooey church. That's right. Amen. I owe him too much. You see, these people, when, when Nahash, the Ammonite, came on them, they were without hope. There was no place to go. They turned to the king and the king responded, I want you to know something that when I discovered my sin, as we had the testimonies here today that people, that's what made the difference. We finally stopped just believing in Jesus with no power. Amen. That's the Dagon religion. No, we, we realize that, hey, we're miserable. We're horrible. We're terrible. And we need Almighty God. And we realize that, you know what? I'm without hope because of my sin. Amen. As a matter of fact, here is, here is your testimony before you were saved. Ephesians 2.12 says, Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. You were lost. You were on your way to hell. You were bound by your sin. You could not turn around. You could not be made free. You could not even lift your head up because you were so in bondage to your pride, to your wickedness, and to your sin. You were held by it. No matter how nice you tried to be. No matter how religious you aspired to be, you were still held by the cords of sin. You could not break it loose. You were without Hope! Amen. But, the Bible says, now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Oh, how I owe Him when I think about the strokes upon His back. Oh, how I owe Him when He bore my crown of thorns. Thorns being a picture of the curse We didn't have thorns until we sinned and the earth was cursed. And He bore that on His head and Christ bore those thorns on His head. He became the King of the curse on the cross that day. Oh God, help us if we don't feel that we owe God something for what He's done for us. Amen? We can never repay Him. We can never work hard enough to pay Him back. We can never uh, uh, pay out our, our salvation either. Amen? And we know that. But once we've been saved by the grace of God, there's no way we could ever repay Him. But I want to tell you, He's given us a way to repay Him. And that is to give a testimony and to stand up and testify that by the glory and the mercy and the grace of God, I was lost and without hope. But He came and He rescued me. And now I'm saved and I'm standing on a solid ground. And the things I once hated, now I love. And the things I once loved, now I hate. It's all because of Jesus. Jesus, oh how I owe Him. Amen. I owe Him my very life. Right. Amen. Amen. See, I was without hope. These men here in the um, Jabesh Gilead, they were without hope and they called on their king. And he, guess what He did? He rescued them. Jesus rescued me. Amen. As a matter of fact, In chapter 11, in verse 11, it says that Saul slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. They which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. My friends, let me tell you something. Before I got born again through repentance and faith based on the blood of Jesus Christ and the calling of the Holy Ghost through the preaching of the Gospel being all of God, God coming to me, God working things out. Before I ever got saved, I had no power over sin. I was religious. Amen. In my life, there was times I was religious. I... um, I led my family to be religious at times. And of course, my wife would be glad because those would be spurts that I would not drink and things like that. I tried to be good. But see, the problem was I was without hope. And that day that Jesus Christ got a hold of my heart and showed me what I really was. I want you to know something. He started taking the blinders off. And he started breaking the chains of sin off of me. I started seeing hope through Jesus Christ. And when Saul came and he slew them until the heat of the day, that's exactly what Jesus did to the devil. 
And he slew him all the way to the heat of hell. Amen. I'm telling you. And then if there were any left, there were, they were scattered and there were not two of them together. You say, what does that mean? I believe it's a good picture of the things in my life. Since I've been saved, I'm still in the flesh. I still work, walk and work in an ungodly world. And I still need God because sins come up, besetting sins. And you know what Jesus did? He gave me the power to scatter them so they cannot remain together. Amen. Cannot hold me down. Amen. That's the power of God. Right. That's totally different than, you know, I'd like to go to heaven. We'll say this prayer. That's a totally different story, isn't it? That's the Dagon crowd. Right. Amen. That's the Ammonite crowd, the Philistine crowd. Anyway, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. What that means is He didn't just declare our salvation. We, we talked about this Wednesday night. God can't just declare anyone saved. His character will not allow it. Right. It can't happen. He's a holy God. He can't say, well, I forgive you. You know what? You've said a prayer. I forgive you. No, there has to be a price paid. Oh, yes. And Jesus was wounded for my transgression. Amen. You see, the, the law was carried out on Christ. I'm the one that's supposed to be wounded. Right. I'm the one that's supposed to be torn down, humiliated, and mocked. But Jesus took my place. And, 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 and the Bible says I, he was bruised for our iniquities. Not only was he wounded for our transgressions, those things that are, that cause us to go against God. Amen. And we have in our lives, we went straight up against God and we knew it. Amen. But he was also bruised for our iniquities. Those things we can't help because we're sinners and we're lost. We just can't help it. I heard y'all testify this morning that, hey, I, I couldn't stop sinning. I just couldn't stop. I tried over and over. I couldn't stop. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. I was without hope. But Jesus stepped in and rescued me. I want you to know something. I owe Him everything. Amen. I owe it all to Him. He gets my testimony. He gets my praise. So why, why did these men hazard their lives and, and go like that? They went totally against what any sound mind would, would, um, advise. And they went at any cost and they rescued their Lord's name. How'd they do that? Why'd they do that? Because they owed him. That means, friends, we owe Jesus and there's not enough envy to stop us. There's not enough bitterness to stop us. And there better not be any self-pity. There's none of that that should ever stop us from serving God, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it leads us to the guillotine, even if it leads us to the Baptist fire. I want you to understand, folks, we owe it to Him. Amen. I owe it to him. So we see how they owed. Let me show you something else about this. Not only did they owe, you say, why did they risk their lives like this? Well, because they owed God. That's why. But why else? It's because they cared. Not only did they owe, they cared. Oh, how they cared. You look at verses 11 and 12, it says, And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from uh, the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. Mm. I can't stand the thought of my Lord's body on that wall and his head in the temple of Dagon. I want you to know that 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Amen. You see, we would all admit we owe God. But I want to ask you this morning, do you care? Do you care when Christ's name is being dragged down? Do you care when people say they're saved, but there's no testimony or fruits in their lives? Do you care enough? 
Because most of the time you see Christians go, well, you know, they're probably saved. They're just not taught. Somebody who thinks you got to be baptized to be born again is lost. You better care. Amen. Somebody that says, yeah, I'm saved. I believed in Jesus since I was a little kid. And in their life, you see them doing all the things the world does, but not quite as bad. Not quite there. Just that arm's reach. They're lost. We better care. Amen. We better care. We better care about them. We better care about us. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the tradition which ye have been taught. You know, when I hear things like this and I see these men and how much they cared, I have to ask myself, do I care? I mean, do I care? Me as a preacher, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's the preacher. It's me and you, bud. We are set up to endure hardness. Yes. That's just the way it is. Amen? And as we've learned in the book of Revelation, those four beasts are a good emblem in the kingdom of God as the preacher that is always lifting up the holiness of God and the, and the church cast their crowns and serve God. Am I right? That's what we're doing this morning. You see, we're taking the gospel and we're taking the doctrines of God and I'm lifting them up and I keep saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We're pointing to Him and His glory. And as a church, we cast our crowns because we are nothing and we owe Him and we care for Him and we bow down before Him. And I want you to know something about the preacher. They're a different creature. They're a different creature than the 24 king priests that sat on the thrones. They're a different creature. We're a different animal. Some people say, yeah, that brother Sam, man, he'll just name something and I think he goes a little too rough or whatever. I'm a different creature than you. Amen? Amen? Uh, Well, I think the preacher ought to show more compassion. Hey, spend some time with me when I'm in prayer and in tears for people. And then tell me how much compassion I need. But when it's time to get up and preach, I want to tell you something. Your flesh is not going to handle compassion. Your flesh needs to be beat down like a red-headed stepchild. Sorry, PJ. Amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. But your, your flesh needs to be beat down. You know, every time we bring somebody to church and... Man, they're a Lutheran or something. Brother Sam's going to preach against Lutherans. That's exactly what they need. Amen. And you say, yeah, but they leave mad. That's how I got saved. That's right. God made me mad. Amen. I loved what Elizabeth said this morning. Amen. He said I was lost. That made me mad. I'm the daughter of a Baptist preacher. You can't tell me I'm lost. She was lost. Best thing ever happened to her was she heard that she was lost. Amen? Amen. That's what we need. Because we care. Amen? I'm supposed to endure hardness. I, I tell you what, sometimes it's a little unbearable. That, And I'll be honest with you, it is a little unbearable that people do things and you think that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches and what we've been teaching for months. Yeah. And people do the exact opposite. And and you just go, (laughs) God, help them. Amen. And, and, And you're constantly burdened. I'm supposed to endure that. I'm supposed to endure that. Not because I'm better and not because I haven't made the same mistakes. But because that's what God set me up to be. Was to preach the gospel and not fear the face of men. Amen. Most people fear the face of men. And I want to tell you, in my flesh, I do. I do. I want to say, ooh, I better better not step on this too hard because, well, they're not there yet. And that's not how you think as a preacher. That's how that, That may be how the sheep think sometimes. But the preacher can't think that way. He has to think, I'm going to preach on sin and I'm going to beat the tar out of the devil Amen. in the flesh and the power of God and let God turn that life around and give him life. Amen? So, do I care enough to be that way? How about this? Deuteronomy 22.5. I'm going to become a fundamentalist real quick just for a second. It says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. 
Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Abomination. That throws you in the same category as a queer. Amen. How did they become queers? Well, because we accepted them being effeminate first. Amen. Women dressing like men, men dressing like women. It's age old. This isn't new to the 70s and Three's Company and John Ritter. It's not that. It, this is old. Amen. There's been all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. And people say, I'm not going to have that preacher tell me what I can wear. I don't have to tell you. The Bible's very clear. And if you don't think a dress is woman's attire and pants are men's, I can't help you there. Amen. Well, somebody will say, what if I have to climb a mountain? Number one, when's the last time you climbed a mountain? Amen. Number two, okay, God, you got this rule, and I know it's an abomination. No, you don't, because if you knew it was an abomination, it'd make you sick like it does him. Amen. And I know it says it's an abomination. And you know, but there are pants for women. No, there's not. There's no such thing. Pants are britches, as we say in the South, britches. But the Bible calls them breeches. Breeches. And the only people in the Bible that are listed as wearing breeches are men. Right. Amen. I'm sorry. Well, I don't like that. I'm sorry. That's right. Do you care? Do you care that that's an abomination to God? Do you care that He died for you to free you from that mess? Do you care? Amen? Do I care? Mr. Long Hair Dude, when 1 Corinthians 11.14 says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Do I not care? I mean, my wife looked at me this morning when we woke up and she said, You need a haircut. Boy, she's right. I do. Amen. This is long for me. I'm, man, I'm, I feel like I'm at Woodstock or something with this hair I got right now. But y'all know it's still man's hair and I don't need a haircut. But we ought to stay away from long hair as men. And I'm telling you, I, I don't believe for a second that the woman that has the attitude of, well, I'm saved, but that preacher, I'm not going to listen to him about those pants. He don't tell me what he does. You're lost, lady. You're lost because you don't care. Right. See, if you're saved, you'll care. Yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. Well, he's not going to tell me I can't wear my earring or I can't have my long hair. or I can't. I'm going to tell you what, I don't have to tell you. The Bible just told you. Matter of fact, nature tells you that you can't have long hair as a man. And if you want to hold on to that long hair and you're going along and you like, you think it's okay to go like this. You call yourself a Christian, you think it's okay to go like this. And feather your bangs and all that bunch of effeminate garbage. You're lost. You know how I know you're lost? Because you don't care. If you cared, your life would change. Amen. There, there's my annual quota of long hair and pants. <laughs> so, okay, I don't have to preach on that anymore for a while. How about this one? <sighs> Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another. Boy, that's what we're doing. I'm exhorting you from the Word of God. And then we together exhort one another. What about that sermon? Yep. What about what the Bible said today? Amen. Amen. Somebody might go, well, I, I'm just not sure I understand. There's a chance, church, to go, well, let me exhort you. Let me tell you what was being said so you can understand. Because we're to exhort one another more and more and, until we see the day approaching. Amen. Listen, you know why you're here? You know why you drove four hours? You know why you flew across the U.S. and y'all had a nightmare of a weekend playing yo-yo between uh, Tennessee and Georgia? I'll tell you why. Because you care. Amen. Amen. You care to be in the assembly of God. Amen. I do too. That's why I can't just say, okay, let's get to church. Ho-hum. No, I want something from God that's going to help us. Amen. Because I care. Anyway... We should care enough to make a difference. We should care if someone's King James. That's right. Amen. Well, I don't really care if they're not King James. You got a problem. Yes, ma'am. We should care about local church. I heard a couple testimonies this morning that mentioned the local versus the universal church. Praise God. You ought to care. We got a family trying to get here from Latvia. 
It's not even their country. It's not even their side of the world. It's not even close to their culture. But they care enough that they know where the gospel is. Amen. And they want to get to it. Amen. Listen, you know what I call you kind of people? I call you Jabesh Gilead. You keep on a owing. You keep on a caring. And you keep serving God. Amen. And you don't stop until your day is done. You care about what kind of music we have in the assembly. You care about if our assembly is separated, if our lives are separated or not. And you even care when the rest of Israel, like it showed in verse 7 of our text, they all just got up and ran. (coughs) I don't care if they come out with the mark system today. Amen. And everybody's going to run and find an excuse to take this mark. They're going to excuse it and say it's not the mark because the rupture, I mean the rapture hasn't happened yet. That's what they're going to be doing. Well, see, we haven't been raptured out of here. The universal world of all the believers hasn't been raptured out. So I'll go ahead and take the mark on my right hand or in my forehead and say it's okay because I haven't been raptured. You're lost. Right. But when the rest of Christendom says, you know what? We're going to fall right in. You know, after all, persecution, we're going to be Jabesh Gilead. We ain't taking that mark. Well, you'll starve. I'll starve. Amen. You know, the last thing I remember is that the grace of God is sufficient. Amen. Amen. And that's why I'm so thankful I got a body of believers to be with because sometimes it's lonely out there. Amen. But I can come in here and we all have the same problem. We all have the same owing to God. We all have the same care for our Savior. And when we come together, I get encouragement, I'm here to tell you. And I hope this message gives you encouragement today. I tell you what, you keep on keeping on even when everybody else gives up. I think about Samson. What a guy. If I wrote a book about Samson, I would entitle it this. Snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. The exact opposite of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Because the guy just struggled with his flesh and failed and so on. But you know, there at the end... When they pulled him out to mock him, and his eyes had been put out. Okay, this is going through your soul, all right? (laughs) He gets out there, and all these Philistines, the same rotten crowd we see here, they are mocking him, throwing things at him, jeering him. And right in the midst of that, he didn't just stand there and take it. He saw an opportunity and he asked the little boy or the, whoever that guided him to take him to the main pillars of that temple. And he prayed to God for the glory of God because Samson finally realized in his life it wasn't just about him. It wasn't just about his eyes. He cared. He cared about the glory of God and he realized that he was a sore witness and he failed in the glory of God that he didn't care as much as he needed to. But now here, right in the midst of defeat, right before he dies, right as all of God's enemies are standing over him, God gives him the power and he pushed those pillars down and that thing was called the temple of Astaroth and it came down on them. I want you to know something. You keep on a owing and you keep on a caring and it don't matter who runs because this Catholic and Protestant and cult mess that we got going on will not prevail. The Bible says that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You want to know what the gates of hell are? We're not talking about a place where you argue with the devil and gates open up and you go in. The gates of hell are the wide path, the broad way that leads through the Catholic church. That's what it is. But y'all knew that. Keep on a caring. So, why did these guys risk so much? Number one, because of how they owed. It's okay. Sinners do that all the time. Amen. Of course, we know. I'm just kidding for them. Oh, how they owed. Oh, how they cared. I'm disturbed by people you preach to and they don't care. Oh, yeah. 
But because they owed and because they cared, I want you to now see what they did. I have a saying, you know, a Christian is is as a Christian does. Not what he says, but what he does. And we see that because they cared, they did something. They didn't wait around. You know what? When they saw what happened and how it injured the glory of God in the eyes of Israel, they didn't have a prayer meeting and say, Oh God, show us what to do. They did something because they cared. They didn't wait. They did. Now, I know a lot of people that can run off half cock. They'll one, read one little verse out of the Bible and run off and be out of context. I know that that's a problem sometimes, but that's few and far between and very rare. And I'd much rather deal with somebody like that because at least they care. But most of the time, that's not how Christians act. Most of the time, Christians just kind of settle back on their leaves and go, God, show us. What about that's your Lord that you owe? What about that's your Lord's name? And you should care. You should have enough care in your life to represent the Lord in the midst of this heathen nation. But you don't. You sit back on your leaves. Oh God, show us what to do. How long would we go, men, if we said, God, show us what to do with street preaching? How much time would we miss doing that mess? See, but because we owe Him and because we care about Him, we're going to street preach every time we get a chance and we don't care where. Amen. Amen. We don't care. It's never about wait. It's about do. Amen. I am so tickled that the Ensenbergs are doing something. I'm so tickled that the Monettes are doing something. Amen. Amen. I'm so tickled that the people in our church, I see them doing something. Reese Biskins called me the other night and he's going to take a flight down here and spend a weekend with us so he can give his testimony and so he can pray with us. And he won't have his daughters with him and he won't have his wife with him because she's leaving him over the gospel as she's taking his kids from him. But he's still seeking out the the, the uh, kingdom of God and he's doing it. He's not waiting. He really cares. Amen. 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 James 2.18 says, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Yep. 1 Corinthians 7.23, You are bought with a price. Luke 16.13, Jesus said, No servant can serve two masters. Pray that he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You know, another way to say that is he'll care for one and not the other. That's what we have to ask ourselves. Let me ask you something. I'm going to ask you something. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do for the kingdom of God? What do you do more now than you did last year this time? Now that really make you think. Ask yourself, what do I do for the kingdom of God? And I don't want to hear this while I pray. I never saw that as a gift. Did you read that as a gift anywhere? Where's your Holy Ghost gift and how are you using it? Where is it? How, what do you do? What do you do that the gospel may be preached to these Gentiles? What do you do? I've got to ask myself that. Amen? And then when it comes down to it, if I look at what I do and it doesn't add up very much, I need to not ask myself, well, do I have opportunities? Do I? No, what I need to ask myself is this. Do I even care? Do I even care? <coughs> These men rallied and conquered. These men said, what can I do? And they went. They didn't look around and go, boy, I wish we had a bigger army. 
No, but they were valiant in their hearts. They were willing. Amen. Listen, it, it, it's like 2 Corinthians 8, 5. When Paul was needing an offering from, for those uh, from Macedonia, it says, And thus they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. It, it's like it's like that ship that Paul was on, that they just cut sail and let her ride. They put their hands, their their selves into the capable hands of mighty God. Amen. You see, my friends, we have to be willing like these guys. We have to be willing. What that means is we have to care because we know we owe. Amen. But I want to tell you something. When you do this, when you take a step of faith, that's when the Jordan River parts. It's not saying, well, Lord said I'll part the river and you go across, so let me stand on the bank and pray about it. He said, you walk across and I'll part the river. So what do we do? We step into the water. And as we do, God starts opening it up. Amen. That's the way the Bible works. That's the way our faith works. Right. Amen. We do something not in our own power. So many times, we as Christians, true believers, will balk because all we can think about is what worked in the past. Or we still hang on to our worldly ideas. I mean, I know that the Bible says it, but am I willing to do it? I'm going to tell you, if you care enough, you will. If you realize you owe Christ everything and you care enough about His glory, you will do what He says. You'll do it. Amen? And it will be by His power. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Listen. Jabesh Gilead was a peaceful people. They had no reputation for war at all. As a matter of fact, the first time we hear of them was way back over there in Judges. I I can't remember which chapter it was. But y'all remember the story. We were talking about it a few weeks ago out here fellowshipping at the tribe of Benjamin. How they turned into mostly Sodomites. And how this priest threw his concubine or whatever out there and he abused her all night and she died and couldn't get back to the house. And, and then they cut her up into 12 pieces and sent her throughout the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. And God says, I want you to think about this. I want you to really look at it and speak your mind about it. And the Bible says that that was the days when there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So then they turn around and they find out, you know what? uh, They they went to war against Benjamin and I mean wiped them out. There was nothing left hardly. And they realized that there wasn't enough women left for the tribe of Benjamin for them to survive. So you know what the tribe of Israel, what the nation of Israel did? They didn't go to God. They didn't let God work this out. They got together and said, well, you know, we were all here rallied together. Who didn't show up? That's what they did. See, that's what the Catholics and the Protestants are all going to do when we have this one world government. Well, we're all here together. Who didn't show up? Those freaky little Baptists didn't show up. And that's the ones that's going to get wasted. The, The people of Jabesh Gilead didn't show up to their little meeting. It was not a meeting brought together by God. It was a meeting of men who did what they thought was their own eye, right in their own eyes. And they come together and say, how do we reconcile this? And they looked over and they said, you know what? Jabesh Gilead didn't come. So they went in there and destroyed Jabesh Gilead. Every little child was wiped out. Every woman that was not a virgin was wiped out. All the valiant men, if there was a man that was able, wiped out. It's only by the mercy of God that we have a Jabesh Gilead by the time we get to chapter 31. 
It's by the mercy of God. So they're a very peaceful people. But now we see Nahash, the Ammonite, shows up, threatens war against them. They're willing to give in. Hey, we don't want any trouble. We don't want any trouble. They're not known for battle. That's the only two times they're mentioned until this time when this little puny beat down group can get up and go right into the heart of the Philistines and rescue the name of their Lord. Folks, that's the church of Jesus Christ. In the dark ages, that Catholic and Protestant group just beat us down. You can't hardly find a history. You can't hardly find a name. They've been wiped out of every nation. But yet, you turn around when you think they're gone. There they are. And here we are today. Because of the Spirit and the power of God. And how they do it? By the Spirit and power and Word of God. Amen. Isaiah forty twenty nine says, He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increaseth strength. My friends, all you got to do is care and get up and do something. He'll give you the power. <laughs> Amen. 1 Corinthians one twenty six says, For you see your calling, brethren, have there not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called? Nope. Why? Why would God do it this way? If the church is to be triumphant, why wouldn't God make it the most powerful political body on planet earth? i tell you why. Because we'd start looking at each other's talents is why. We'd start putting our own plan together to get more government is why. But God takes the littlest old thing like Old Paz Baptist Church and we're not special. There's nobody, well, I mean, we got different degrees and so on, but there's nobody here that would stand out as the elite of society. And He takes us, sometimes we're the biggest knuckleheads in the world, and He takes us and He uses us for His glory. How did He do it? It's His own power and because He gets the glory, not us. 1 Corinthians 1, 29 says that no flesh should glory in His presence. Right. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Now, we owe Him. We owe Him everything. I'll never see hell because of Him. Amen. Right now, this is the most hell I'll ever endure. Right. Because of Him, I owe Him. Now the question today, Christian, is do you care? Do you care? Because that's the pivotal point. If you See, I believe if you don't care, you're not saved. That's right. But I believe if you do care, you'll do. You'll do something with that. And you'll keep on doing it until Jesus comes back. Now, let me give you a little... I'll close with this illustration. But this will bless your heart. In 1 Samuel 5 and verse 4, I, I won't have you turn there. The Philistines had robbed the ark. And they brought it into the temple of Dagon. Yep. Interesting, they put Saul's head there because they looked to their kings as gods. That's what Gentiles always do. That's what this uh, welfare crowd does now. We've got to get America back to God. We've got to get Trump in there. They look at that as God. Amen. Whether they like it or not, that's what they look at. Amen. So anyway, they put the ark in there. And I believe it was three times that they walked in. And Dagon, the big statue of Dagon, the big fish head dummy, had fallen down before the ark. The third time they walked in there, that big old statue fell down and its head was off and it set over, rolled over into the threshold of walking in the temple. And, and then his hands came off and they too rolled over into the threshold of his temple. So much that the only way the Philistines could get back into that temple to set him up was to swing over jump over because they weren't going to step on the hands or the head of their little God. 
And to this day, the the Philistines had a tradition, uh, or at least uh, as long as they existed, they had a tradition in the temple of Dagon that when they walked in, when them priests walked in, they would jump over the threshold and never put their foot on it. Because of that day, see, they took what was a curse and they turned it into something they felt was positive. Yeah. Like them Romish traditions. Kiss this, bow that, drink this, do that. Do it when, do it how. Amen. But as that statue fell, as God's enemies fell, and their God fell, and His head rolled off, I want you to know our Lord Jesus is coming back, and the beast that rises out of the sea is going to fail. Amen. The church will be triumphant. Jesus said that it will, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We will go into the kingdom triumphant, and it's all going to come down to this. You say, I want the rewards. I want the talents. Amen. It all is going to boil down to this. How much did you care? And because of that, what did you do? I'm going to stop right there.